And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us straight from Hypersphere Games and the creators of the upcoming Facet of Facets of Fate TTRPG, which is going to be which is going to be using cards and there and therefore gets my attention. The one and only Roger Vanderheim, <laughs> or Helm. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. It is a Dutch name, so. Nobody gets it right if, unless they're Dutch. <laughs> you know, to, and to be fair, I will take I will take dealing with Dutch over dealing with Polish. All right. <laughs> uh, I I just have I just have the absolute worst luck with tr with trying to pronounce Polish names. They are uh, as, as exceptionally foreign to uh, m most non Cyrillic uh, languages. Mm -hmm. Uh well, that and the one time I covered something a a Slavic based setting, I ended up screwing up pronunciations to the point where I asked the guy in question, "Please put in a pronunciation guide because I'm pretty <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be an isolated case." Yeah, but I'd like to start. I'd like to start at the humble beginnings, in a sense. Mm -hmm. Uh Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. It's been, I think, about 17 years now, maybe 18. Mm -hmm. um, I was in uh, high school, uh, and I don't not remember exactly, but just some some friends uh, came with it once wants to play, and I was like, yes, yeah, sounds like fun, and I never have really heard of it before. Uh, it was Devil's D&D uh, &D, uh, Third Edition. Mm -hmm. 3.5 um, and we started our first uh, short adventure I, th I think it was a custom adventure as well not 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 something uh, pre-made um, I think the guy G uh, DMing that uh, adventure had played before but I'm not entirely sure um, so we played that and we enjoyed it. So we kept playing, started doing other stories, uh, all types of different stories. And at some point, um, when I went to a university, I picked up a new group. Uh, th those were all playing uh, Pathfinder, first edition. Mm -hmm. And But that was a, a game design uh, study, so... A lot of different other systems were explored and uh, experimented with. Um, we uh, several people created their own uh, D six systems or just a, something very simple to see how that would play, and uh, explore the possibilities of role playing games. Mm -hmm. So my my love bloomed there where it was already uh, g going strong. Yeah, and, I, and in I, recent years, I met some other people, and those uh, with th those I've played at least seven other systems as well, just to see what is out there and how different systems impact the storytelling. Mm -hmm. Now, going from all of that to a car to a cart to a card based narrative leaning si narrative leaning system is cert is certainly is certainly quite the jump. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I suppose I suppose one of the first things I, I want to ask on that is, how did the idea for facets of facets of fate start, and what made you want to go with a card based system more than anything else? So we're a team of four people who have all played various uh, RPGs in uh, to, to different degrees, um, and all of us felt uh, that. The most common systems like D and D and Pathfinder were um, th they were e easily accessible, but they were lacking in um, consistency within the rules, and e e there was still a, a bit of a barrier to play. Uh, we felt certainly for some types of players, um, mm -hmm. and we 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 felt we could um, to do better might be a bit. Uh, 
high uh, but more like we thought we could improve upon the ideas that exist or already exist in the RPG world. So we uh, went about seeing, okay, what do we want this system to be? What are our design philosophies to start out with? And one of the first things was we wanted to be easy to play and optional to master. So th there has to be some depth to it, but the depth has to be optional. You can, if you don't want to go into that, you can just still you can still play the game. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so we literally at some point went, okay, so how do we determine success or failure for any action that a character wants to do? Um, and we looked at, of course, uh, dice were the the easy solution that everybody is using. But we thought, okay, but what are all other options? So um, uh, we we went we considered uh, picking straws or uh, uh, just a, a random generated number from a from a mobile app. Uh, and we and and cards were also put on the table, like mm -hmm. some form of card system, um, and. All of these options, uh, we looked at the pros and cons, uh, and dice are very, they are everywhere. So everybody already has them. So those are, everybody knows how they work. So that's an advantage, but they are also unpredictable to some degree. And you as a player have very little control over how the dice fall. Uh, and we felt that uh, a card-based system uh, especially one where you can create your own deck of cards um, would solve that. So we thought, okay, how can we make a card-based system where the cards are easy and universal? Uh, so we don't want people uh, having to read a card, for a lot of text on it to get an effect from it. No, we want the card to be just a pure visual. You look at it once and know what it does, just like any normal um, deck of 52 cards you look at it, you know exactly what it does. It's a number and there's a suit. Something similar to that uh, is what we were looking for. And uh, by building your own deck of about 20 cards, is what we went for, uh, allows you to put together a variation of card that uh, supports the kind of gameplay that you are looking for as a player and as a character. So mm -hmm. that, that's how we started, uh, and we designed the cards uh, eventually uh, with the, the four core um, suits on it, as, as we call it. So we have mental, social, physical, and magical. Uh, those are our four main suits of gameplay. Uh, anything you do falls within those things. Uh, and uh, the cards only represent those aspects as well, just so, so everything in the game falls within those categories. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's that's how we how we went with cards, yeah. basically. Now, the the big reason why the card why the card based thing got my attention to the point where I wanted to reach out is card based design is not is not is not um unheard of, but it is still a minority within yeah. R within RPG design. Just. Anytime, anytime you're not using dice, it ma it makes people have this almost visceral reaction, as if <laughs> as if um di as if dice are the only randomizers you should be using in a role playing game. Uh, That's funny. Funny you say that because uh, we've we've been play testing with various types of players and. Uh, the one thing that everybody universally likes about our system are how the cards work. Uh, and those are play people who have either not played at all or who have been playing for years and years using D&D &D and other systems. And they're all like, oh, wait, th this, this dice system is... It, it takes a bit of getting used to initially. You're like, okay, but how does it work? It needs explanation where a die is. You roll it and you know what yeah. it says. Uh, but once you get uh, past the initial hurdle, uh, it is mm -hmm. so much more interesting and under your control as a player. Yep. And when it comes to, I'm I'm most I'm mostly facetious when I talk about the whole visceral reaction because I've there I had a I had an incident s uh, several years ago where. Some, where somebody was where somebody was dismissive about the symbol based dice that you see in um, Genesis, right? Yeah, that's Genesis spelled with a Y because poor literacy is cool. 
<laughs> and he he had said that th that that kind of symbol based dice is too complicated. And then I looked at I looked at his currently playing list, and he was playing um the he was playing the Dresden Files, a game that uses fi a game that uses fate, and fate right, uses yeah. fudge dice. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> It's. I thought it was a little. I had to call him out on that because it's a bit hypocritical to get on one game for symbol-based dice when you're playing another game that uses symbol-based dice. <laughs> I mean, symbol-based dice. I I only learned of them, I think, uh, four or five years ago. I first encountered them in another game. I think that was uh, the Star Wars RPG system by. Yeah, that's that's yeah. that's retroactively part of Genesis because they're oh, right. using even the they're not the dice aren't named the exact same thing, but the way attributes and skills work, the way ta the way talents kind of work, even though Genesis has a talent pyramid instead of out instead right. of um, career trees. Uh, right. But other, other than that, everything everything is more or less the same. Yeah, th th those dice systems, I I, I love them. Uh, I thought they were really good. Mm -hmm. uh, much I much prefer them to to uh, the the classical number dice, partially because um, the having to remember modifiers uh, at some point becomes tedious and mm -hmm. uh, for some players uh, a turn off as well. Yeah, and I I can I can certainly I can certainly see that. And as far as as far as a card based system being tr being tricky to, being um tricky to get used to i've always found that a bit strange because everybody is familiar with the 52 card deck yeah whether whether it be th whether it be through poker whether it be through blackjack whether it be through war whether it be through 50 57 card pickup everybody has played using cards pretty much all yeah. magicians use cards as well for the same reason it's something that everybody you, you look at it and you know exactly what you, what to expect yeah and me personally a lot there's there's I'm no stranger to that being used in role playing games cuz I've spoken highly about the saga system that TSR put out in the in the mid 90s through Dragonlance 5th Age and the Marvel Adventure game and mm -hmm. The same goes for its successor in um, Saga Machine, um, which, which it, which, that one by that one by Tab Creations is a is 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 host to a bunch of different games. The first one that I got introduced on that front was Against the Dark Yogi, um, right? And I'd say the I'd say the one of the one parallel that I ended up making based on how you guys were. We're declaring. We're um, noting how your system worked. Was um, Everway, and I, I did want to. I didn't want to ask if that name had gotten brought had gotten brought up no, during it's, testing it's, or not. It's not not one I'm familiar with. So uh, no, it's not been brought up yet. Um, just for the skin, just for the skinny on it to to, to mm -hmm. maybe to maybe help see why why I made that comparison. Um, Everway was the brainchild of Jonathan Tweet, the same guy who would be who would. Be one of the co-creators of D and D third edition. Right. Uh, this was this was or this was um, early nineties, pre pre D and D Wizards of the Coast. Right. And the uh, the central idea was a tarot inspired deck of cards called the Fortune Deck, right. which yeah had a, had a different approach and has and has become massively influential. To the point where, when I did when I did a review of it, I compared it to I compared it to the the um the album "The Shape of Punk" to come by Refused, in the sense mm -hmm. that it, people like people like it now, but it but it wasn't as well received at the time. Yeah, but it is not. But Everway is not trying to do a pass a pass fail kind of success system. No, I describe it as a "what happens next" kind of yeah, system. Yeah, exactly. The, the, that, that's what what I encountered uh, more often looking at cards. That's also what people expect for for to some degree mm -hmm. uh, when they look at the cards. So one of the the the, the 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 common confusion we got initially was: so I've got a card that says it's a rat on it, so I can now play a rat, right? And it's, no, no, the rat is just uh, a symbol. It's just 
uh, a, a nice visual representation of, of the gems that are on the card, the, the symbols that are used by the card. It's not actually a rat. And that, that, that was, but, but once you get past that first hurdle, the pass fail does, it, it does more, uh, more resemble a die roll in that regard. So it's in between somewhere. Mm -hmm. And sp speaking of that, when it comes to the cards and the overall design, I I find it interesting that you went with this almost stained glass ap approach to the visual design. Where where did that come from? We were looking at uh, different ways to design the cards uh, because we want want them to have a, a specific look, mm -hmm. and so that once you look at them, they all make sense. Um, we also have some limitations in uh, what our artists can and cannot do. Uh, we don't have a professional artist in our team, so we were looking at what can we do with the skill set that we have that would look good, um, be easy to produce uh, in larger uh, scale. Mm. And the stained glass look um, is relatively uh, easy to do, but still allows for a lot of um, creativity and uh, ha has its own distinct style. Uh, and uh, our main artist uh, does have actual experience with stained glass, uh, so he knows what stained glass can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. So the car we we were able to make the cards realistically stained glass, not just visually stained glass. Mm -hmm. Now, with the with that in mind, I I also I also found it. Very interesting that you get that you guys have a um, a char a character management tool, yeah. Uh, especially which is some is something is something I I I kind I kind of wish more games would would ut would utilize in in one form or another. The un I think the only the only game that goes that ex that goes extensive as you have when it comes to character manage when it comes to digital character management in my experience has been Lancer. Right. Uh oh. so the, the the character management tool was a um, initially a necessity because um, we, we were using like uh, writing jotting down notes on a card and then on a piece of paper putting them in a sleeve and using them as a deck of cards, mm -hmm. uh, which was functional but not ideal. Um, so we thought, well, we're gonna have to play test this game at some point and. We don't have the money to print 200 cards, let alone 200 cards for each playtester. So we'll have to uh, somehow uh, get a playtest functional system up. Um, we are all, or most of us are coders uh, as part of our uh, university uh, experience. So creating something digitally was relatively easy. Uh, so we coded up and quickly uh, prototyped this uh, this deck building system, mm -hmm. uh, which allowed in initially just to create a deck of cards from a selection of cards and to play with those cards to make to disti to um, distinguish between different zones. Um, and once we had that, we were like, well, this is something we can offer to players. Just that that's so relatively easy for us. It's something that a lot of players might prefer. Uh, to physical cards in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when we had that was like, yeah, we have a talent tree system. We could, might as well just implement that into the same application. That's not that difficult. Um, so uh, uh, we programmed that in and that was now just part of the package as well. Mm -hmm. And of course, the the other thing that the other thing that I... I find I find in I find interesting is the is the is the talent is the talent tree system itself, which um, loosely reminds me of the sphere grid from Final Fantasy X in the way in the way it's designed overall, especially with all of the classes having a certain starting point. Right. I I, I haven't actually played Final Fantasy X. But if I recall, it's very similar to Path of Exile as well. Um, I have heard I have heard of the system, yeah, and yeah, that was uh, the, the Path of Exile one was a specific inspiration for our system, um, and I, I believe the two are very similar. So yeah, that that is indirectly possibly a uh, an inspiration. Yeah, 
and when it comes to now with with that in with that in mind when it when it comes to when it comes to just the um cr just the creations the creation system um the other thing that i couldn't help but notice is you get is you guys are relying far more on um s on symbols than on traditional stats yeah <clears throat> Uh, that that is uh, that that's comes from two different for for, for two, two different reasons. The first reason is we want in the design process we want to remove as much math for the player as possible, uh, so that they can just play the game, and um, that means that we c everything we do uh, attempts to uh, re retain low numbers. So every stat you have is limited to five. Every uh, card has limited maximum of six different symbols on it, um, so all the numbers are low, and which mm -hmm. allows us to create uh, symbols that we can just show, similar to the symbol dice systems for like the, the the Star Wars one yep. and the, the, the Genesis that you mentioned. Um, so that, that that allows us to do that. Uh, it also means that uh, people who are dyslexic or uh, has, have dyscalculi um, have an easier time getting into the system, relatively speaking, mm -hmm. because uh, we've taken into account that everything has to have a symbol, has to have a color coded, has to be um, visually, you have to look at it and immediately know how much of it you need. Mm -hmm. um, so that is uh, the, the design philosophy of easy to easy to learn. Everything is just you look at it and you know immediately what it's supposed to represent. Yeah, and ev and even with that, a lot of it's still a lot of it is still relying on f on um, five 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 pillars that you get that you guys have. Yeah. Which, if I, if I recall correctly, are um, mental. Physical, social, magical, and wealth. Yeah, um, absolutely. Now, give, given that those are are the fi are the five basic stats, how does how does that play out with both the deck and with and with the talent system? Right. So every uh, every character, every player character, at least uh, has those five stats with a minimum value of one, which allows us to always assume that you have at least one. Um, and uh, th th there is a distinction between magic and wealth and the other three. So uh, physical, mental, social are the core aptitudes, as we call them. Um, and whenever you want to perform any action, um, the gem decides which aptitude that action falls into, which category. Mm -hmm. And then you draw cards equal to the, the number you have on your sheet of that category. Uh, so if you want to do something physical, um, the GM says, "Well, that's a f you want to jump this uh, this fence. Fine, that's a physical uh, challenge. Um, draw me cards equal to your physical aptitude." And then the mm -hmm. player draws cards. Uh, they look at the cards and can say, "Well, I've got enough gems on these cards to pay for the cost that the GM said." Um, and then I succeed, or you don't because you can't pay the cost. Um, so the, the, those those are the core three of, uh, aptitudes. How they work, magic. Um, is always combined with one of those other three. So whenever you do want to do something magical, like cast a spell, uh, the spell will also have a physical, mental, or social aspect to it, uh, which determines which uh, which card number you use. Uh, the magic app to itself is only used to determine the maximum effect of that spell. Mm -hmm. uh, and wealth uh, has no limit in its in its value, which is uh, unique among the other uh, compared to the other four and uh, allows you to uh, get reduction in costs for certain checks uh, if you are paying for it. Mm -hmm. So if you want to buy something, you can say, oh, I, use my, I uh, use my wealth to, uh, to buy this thing. And then the GM says, oh, that's fine. That means you get a significant cost reduction on this check to buy the thing. Mm -hmm. Now, when... Now, as I, as I recall, you meant you you mentioned that that a lot of a lot of the action economy begins and ends with gems. Yeah. Is is it a case where ev where every action that would require card use is go is going to consume gems? Yes. So um, 
whenever uh, someone wants to do something, it's we call it a turn, whether mm -hmm. or not it's actual in turn order or anything. Mm -hmm. That turn starts with what does the character who is who's the active character want to do, and they can they, there is no limit in to what they can describe that they want to do. If they want to uh, walk two hundred miles, climb up a, st a, a flight of stairs, punch someone in the face, and walk back, that is actually allowed within the rules of what you can declare. There's no action economy in that regard. Uh, instead, all the all the different actions that you describe have a cost associated with it, and you just add all those costs together for that turn, mm -hmm. and you draw cards once for each turn. Um, so if you want to walk uh, 200 miles is a bit much, but if you walk w want to walk into a building, um, uh, grab something from a table and walk out, that's like three different act actions, which depending on the distance you have to walk is probably like three gems worth of actions. Uh, then gems is fine. That's three gems. I want mm -hmm. you to draw cards equal to physical because those are physical actions. And then see if you can produce three gems for me, three physical gems. Yep. Player draws cards, checks their cards, says, ah, I have three physical gems. Mm -hmm. I can pay for these actions. Yeah. And that way the action economy is uh, limited to how good you are at particular activities, not so much uh, an arbitrary number of actions or distance yeah. that you can walk. Which... Is some is something that uh, is something that was in the back of my mind because when I when I heard about the whole thing with gems, what instantly came to mind was the gem system in Marvel Universe and how, uh, by have by having by having every now granted Marvel Universe is a diceless game, right. meaning and meaning no randomizer period, but everything revolving around red and white right, gems. Yeah. And yeah, whenever yeah. there's a, whenever there's a game that has a limited resource, a th a thing that's always in the back of my mind is what is whether or not the game will be subject to what I call the rainy day paradox or the ninety nine megalixers um, paradox. You know the the whole thing of I can't I can't use I can't use one of my ninety nine megalixers. What if I need it for later? Yeah. Well, that, that, we solve that by saying that the, the gems you have disappear at the end of your turn, regardless of what you do. So saving them up is pointless. Mm -hmm. um, the, there is a certain degree where you can keep cards in your hand until your next turn. So if you want to do take multiple turns after each other, that's possible. You can draw cards every time for those different actions. So there is, and there's an unlimited amount of times that you can draw new cards. There's we don't put limits on that. Mm -hmm. There's just uh, there are consequences for failure, uh, which is uh, baked into the core rule uh, that when you want to do something uh, and the GM says, well, that's really there are no consequences for failing that, so you just succeed. You don't have to worry about paying gems for it. Mm -hmm. You don't even get to draw cards for it. You just do it. Um, same if it's impossible. The GM says it's not possible what you're trying to do, so I I, I won't let you draw cards, but you, because you cannot succeed. Yeah. Is the um, requ is the yeah. required amount of gems the equivalent of um, difficulty rating? Yes. So if you want to want to hit someone, that's generally a very relatively easy thing to do. That's one gem. Uh, but if you want to hit one, someone four times in the same turn, uh, the cost ramps up because it becomes a, a pr uh, progressively more difficult to do so. Um, same if you want to scale a uh, waist high wall, that's easy. If you want to climb a wall that that's 10 meter high, that's difficult. So the cost for that is higher. Mm -hmm. um, and that, but it's all part of the same action. So you have to pay, be able to pay it with the same number of cards. Yeah. Now I'd like to get into a bit of the an anatomy of a of an individual card. Mm -hmm. uh, with a, with a lot of with a lot of them, if I'm not mistaken, you have you have some sort of you have some sort of image and what and um a sim a symbol that if I'm not mistaken would determine the amount of gems that it has or that at at least the at least what it would require. Uh, so yeah, the, a card has in the background has some art. Uh, mm -hmm. All cards eventually at the end of this project will have art. We're still working on producing it. Mm -hmm. Um, but we have a few examples of what we're of the style we're going for. Uh, but the, the, the art has no game mechanical effect. Then there's yep. the name at top. Mm -hmm. uh, the name is for the most part unique to each card, so you can use it to identify different cards mm -hmm. easily. 
uh, and make sure people are not cheating by having the same card twi in the deck twice. Um, then you have the number in the top right, which is uh, the card value. Mm -hmm. uh, the card value is equal to the number of gems on that card. Uh, we just we, we determined that that was probably the easiest and still fair way to do it, and is used to determine uh, how each deck can have a maximum number of card value combined into it. Mm -hmm. So the starting maximum deck value is 35, so all the cards combined cannot exceed 35 points mm -hmm. uh, worth of gems, basically. Yeah. That that number is pretty much there only to make it easy to uh, look at all the cards and count them up. So for the most part, you can ignore that as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, then each card has... Um, four places on it uh, as part of the art where there are gems which can range between one or five gems of any given type mm -hmm. and no more than six uh, gems of uh, all types combined mm -hmm. um, and those are the, the actual uh, core part of the card that that's the key information that you need whenever you look at a card uh, I'm looking at the Titan right now, for example, and the Titan has three magical gems and three physical gems, and uh, those are that—that that is the use of that card for physical and uh, and uh, magical activities. Mm -hmm. Anything else is useless. So if I'm looking for magic uh, social gems, I'll look at the card. Go no social, no social. Ah, this one has social. I'll play this one. Yeah. Um, and for the rest, there's a card number and some copyrights thing on there as well, but that's yeah. not really relevant for the most part. <laughs> yeah. So ba based on how you based on how you describe it, um, it does it does sound like there there is an actual degree of um de of deck building in, ter in especially given the the value limit that you that was mentioned. Mm -hmm. It's not a case of, it's not a case like in Saga where you're drawing from a unified deck. Yeah. So the the, the goal is that every player can create their own deck, um, and. The, the the cards that they put in their deck influence what types of activities that they will be better at or the odds of succeeding at a particular type of activity. So it is entirely possible and allowed to create a deck that has no social gems in it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. You will never be able to succeed at anything if it's social. It, I wouldn't advise it personally, but you can do that and that can be a character concept that you have. Yeah. Uh, same for physical or mental or magical. Mm -hmm. Um so yes, there's a degree of deck building involved. Um, it is ex exceptionally flex flexible. You ca you are allowed to modify your deck at any point between sessions. Uh, the only re restriction is during a session you cannot change your deck. That mm -hmm. means that if you are expecting a particular type of session, you might go like, all right, so we're doing a, a mystery uh, session and next time. I might want to put some extra mental gems in my deck. And that's allowed because it represents uh, what your character is expecting is uh, mentally prepared for or uh, energy-wise prepared for. Mm -hmm. And the gem can surprise you and screw you over uh, as a result if, uh, if if they're being mean. Yeah. Now, with given that, it's it definitely sounds like you are actively discouraging people from, people from hyper-focusing in one particular... I guess suit. I guess suit is the best word I can I can use for the time yeah, no, being. Suit is exactly the word we use as well. Uh, but it's it sounds that's not to say you want people to be jack of all trades, but definitely jack of several trades instead instead uh, of focusing all in all in one. We want people to. Um, it's not no. It's, I, I would say it's not entirely accurate. Um, the we wouldn't advise removing some everything of one type from your deck because you will, will still want to be able to at least have a chance of succeeding in some cases mm -hmm. and you never know what kinds of unexpected costs might come your way uh, there are uh we, we do encourage cooperative play uh and teamwork between different characters so we uh, we, we heavily uh f um Rewards gameplay where one player, where two different players have very different stats mm -hmm. that complement each other, so that uh, one person's weakness is another person's strength. Um, so the the, the 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 deck building promotes that as well. Um, it is absolutely a viable option to hyper focus and uh, during playtests we have seen that work very well because you as a player have a lot of control over what types of costs you you will be paying during gameplay. Mm -hmm. Because you are saying what you want to do, and there is there are 
expectations of what types of gems you will need to do that in pretty much most situations. Mm -hmm. um, there we have, because we everybody has at least one in every uh, aptitude, uh, we guarantee that you will always be able to draw at least one card when you want to do something. Mm -hmm. And uh, as long as your deck has at least one card with a given type of gem on it, you will have at least at least a 5% chance of succeeding, probably. Yeah. Now, I want to shift into the into um, talents. Yeah. So obviously there is the there is the ta there is the talent um bo there is the talent board on the Kickstarter page. Mm -hmm. uh, and as as mentioned before, it's clear it's clear that certain archetypes are going to have certain um star certain starting points. But mm -hmm. I suppose the f the first thing to, the first thing to note is the three way the three way divide the three way divide between the three colors. I'm guessing that I'm guessing that that is um fit that that is that that, that is your I get I guess for the lack of a better term the warrior rogue mage um s splitting off even if it's not exactly that word for word. So we have uh, in total four different talent trees mm -hmm. uh, in the rules, and each talent tree represents uh, one of the four uh, main aptitudes: so physical, social, mental, magical. Mm -hmm. um, those are there is no um, overlap between those, so uh, a, there might be some confusion with the example we've shown on our Kickstarter. Um, but the idea is that there's there's four boards and every uh, tree has its uh, has different starting points for all of the classes. Mm -hmm. uh, the we have seven classes and each board has four starting points where one starting point represents the other classes that are not particularly well versed in that particular talent tree. Mm -hmm. uh, they have access, but it's not the main focus of what they have uh, an aptitude for, uh, a predilection towards. Uh, so if you have the physical talent tree, for example, then there's uh, the athlete represents the physical pinnacle of all the classes. So it has the central starting point. It can go anywhere in the physical tree mm -hmm. with uh, impunity. It can just go like, I want to go for this part and this talent. Even though they're on opposite sides of the boards, I can get to both pretty easily. Uh, well, the captain um, is divided between social and physical in its primary uh, aspects. So it has uh, two special starting points in each of those trees. Mm -hmm. uh, and that way, uh, each of the classes has uh, talents that are near it and talents that are further away, um, me which result in if you want to be someone who's very good in uh, close-up quarters fighting, mm -hmm. then an athlete or a captain will get you there quicker than an adventurer or a scholar would. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the same goes for different towns elsewhere where different classes have a more easy access to. But in the end, every class can get anywhere. Um, any talent is accessible for any class. Uh, there is no restriction on that. Yeah. And with the, now with that with that in mind, when it comes to when it comes to gain, when it comes to gaining individual ta individual talents, I know that I know that you guys mentioned wanting to wanting to cut down on math, but in the in the full book, will will it be listed out as far as what you're getting from get from acquiring in it, acquiring each talent. Yeah. So we have uh, the the bulk of the rules text uh, at this point. It consists of the individual talents and their effects. Mm -hmm. Um, and the idea is that you don't need to know every talent. You only need to know the talents that you have. Um, and uh, you pick them as you want from the board. Mm -hmm. Now, the, I also see I also see a whole lot of the ge of the gem symbols. Um, right. Is that is now f from what I from what I assume just me just messing around with the character manager, the gem is the what is the wealth attribute is that the case on the on the talent tree on um, the way it is on it, the talent it tree it is not the uh in the uh, application the the wealth uh, ap aptitude uh symbol is still uh, a temporary uh symbol pro possibly mm -hmm. uh, we're still 
deciding that the gems on the talent trees uh, represent an increase to your maximum deck value. So you start out with 35, and every mm -hmm. time you buy one of those blue gems, uh, you increase it by one, uh, which means eventually you can have a deck value that's over 80 or 90 uh, combined card value, mm -hmm. which allows you to say, no, I don't need unique effects. I just want more deck value. I want to increase my deck value, and that is possible. Yeah. Now, and they function as a connection connection points between other talents. Now, with all with all of that in mind, is th is Facets of Fate the, a kind of game where the where the act where a lot of the action a lot and a lot of the drawing and the and the like is is done is done by players a la, a la the a la the players only role attitude that Cipher has. I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, what I'm ma what I'm mainly asking is that is, it's it sounds like an, it sounds like any sort of any sort of card use is going to be on the player's side, not the GM side. Yes, absolutely, yes. So in fact, the GM does not have a deck of cards mm -hmm. uh, at all, and um, the I the design that we went for is that whenever an NPC wants to do something. Um, the GM throws up a cost that players can pay if they want to avoid that effect. So if uh, an enemy wants to attack a player character with a sword or whatever, uh, the GM says, all right, uh, you're being attacked. If you don't want to get hit, you will have to pay this uh, cost here. And uh, the player can say, well, I, I, I have actually a, a card in my hand that allows me to pay the cost, so I'll pay that cost. I won't get hit this time. Mm -hmm. so there's some uh, players will have to the cards that they draw are used both offensively and defensively. Yeah. Now, with when you meant when you mentioned defense, I'm get I'm guessing I'm guessing that'd be a case of if some if somebody had to defend against a, a an attack from a from a sword, the th the thing that the GM would say would say on that front is the difficulty of it, i.e., how many gems that attack yes. is. Yes. Uh, now, now with all th with all that in with all that in mind, uh, I think the the there's a few there's a few things that were on the site that I did want that I did want to ask about. Chief mm -hmm. among them is what's referred to as the fate clock. Ah, yes. Uh, the fate clock is our. Uh custom form of initiative management mm -hmm. so um, like like every part of the design process we looked at uh, well at some point players and GMs might want to have some form of initiative management uh, because d determining in which order people get to declare their actions can be exceptionally relevant uh, in fast-paced scenarios um, so we looked at various different ways of doing that the standard way of uh, like, like, like that that D uses where you, everybody rolls and we see randomly in which order people go um we looked at system like popcorn initiative as i'm uh, as i'm as i know it which mm -hmm. is uh, w one player goes and gives the turn to the next character whether that be a gm character or a player character and, and so forth until everybody has had a turn mm -hmm. and um eventually uh, we wanted it to be we don't. We don't want players to draw cards to see who goes first, because that could skew it towards particular types of optimizing, which we didn't want to be present in our game. Uh, and we came up with the fate clock, which is a literal clock uh, with six wedges, six uh, points in time, uh, and it just goes round and round, uh, one wedge at a time, uh, giving the turn to the next character. Mm -hmm. And uh, players and GM characters can just uh, place themselves on that clock uh, pretty much freely. So they can move it about uh, and see, I want to take a turn with that other character over there. When they are taking a turn, I also want to take a turn. Mm -hmm. uh, allowing uh, both GM characters and player characters to take simultaneous turns. If you want to help another character, uh, assist them, as, uh, as our system calls it, then you just place your character in a specific zone dedicated to assisting uh, of the turn of another character, and you go, well, whenever that player's turn comes around, I am there to assist them in whatever they're going to do. Mm -hmm. um, so the fake lock allows uh, people to visually see when everybody's turn is, keep track of what is going on, 
uh, removes the need of having to uh, keep track of delays and uh, changes in order because it's just if some you turn a dial and whoever is on that turn is the, is the character whose turn it is. Mm -hmm. um, and since every wedge has room for both uh, player characters and uh, GM characters, there is no fighting between, uh, there is no conflict between the GM and the players for who gets the turn first between GM and player characters mm -hmm. because they can go simultaneously. That, may, that certainly makes sense for, for me. Now, the other, the other, the other action, the other, um, item that I wanted to go over is the approach plan. Yeah. So so the approach plan is uh, the, the, the second of the two main um, the, next to the faith clock. The, the, there are two things that we, that we ideally place on the table and people can uh, place their, uh, their characters on mm -hmm. to keep track of a particular stat where faith clock represents time, uh, approach plan represents intent. Uh, an approach to how how a situation is resolved. Um, the approaches there are twelve approaches uh, divided among the three uh, main aptitudes equally. So there's five mental, five social, five physical, with overlap for three of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea is that uh, whenever everybody starts out as in a neutral approach, you don't have a particular approach to whatever you're doing. Um, and this confers neither benefits nor penalties to what you're doing it's just you're doing what you do you don't have you can ignore the approach plan completely mm -hmm. however a character can say well actually i want to go to an aggressive approach um because i think that if i'm a i, I want to approach this situation aggressively um and they can take an action to go to the aggressive approach and uh, they remain there as long as they want and as long as they're taking an aggressive approach Whenever they are doing something that would benefit from being aggressive, like intimidating someone or uh, trying to punch someone real hard, uh, then uh, the gem is uh, the player can ask, "Can I get some? Uh, can I get some? What's the word? Um, make my action cheaper mm -hmm. because I'm taking the aggressive approach." And the gem can say, "Yeah, sure, that's fine. You, uh, your action is now one a gem cheaper." Uh, and you can get that every turn as long as you're taking the aggressive approach and doing aggressive actions. Mm -hmm. As a drawback, we also say that if you're doing something that would be hindered by being aggressive, like trying to sweet talk someone or uh, think something through uh, calmly and collectively, uh, then the gem can say, no, wait, uh, I'll, I'm making that more difficult for you. So you have to pay an additional gem uh, on your action if you want to do that. Mm -hmm. And this way, players can differentiate uh, how they approach a particular situation. GM characters can do the same, can also get uh, advantages from taking particular approaches. Mm -hmm. uh, we have talents that interact directly with particular approaches. So there's a talent, the talent that says, well, while you're taking an aggressive approach, you can do this unique, uh, get, get this unique benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, and th that way, all approaches are represented in all the two different talent trees. Uh, uh, in equal uh, measure. And finally, the approach plan is also used as a unique uh, mechanic in resolving conflicts. Conflicts being uh, the overarching term for combat, uh, but also for social and mental situations. Mm -hmm. um, so whenever you're in a conflict, um, the, the GM may say, well, you can resolve this conflict by defeating everybody that is opposing you. That's the, the straightforward solution. But that might be more difficult than you uh, than you might expect because you know people you're fighting might be stronger than you. That's possible. Mm -hmm. But Jem can say, well, there is a, uh, there's a special uh, win condition for this conflict. If you can gain control of this conflict in both an aggressive and a let's say instinctive way, then um, then you win the conflict even if there are still enemies standing. That re representing that you have so much control over the situation that even though the enemies are still able to fight back, they have no more, no chance of winning anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the approach plan is used as a win alternate win condition system. Mm -hmm. Now, with the, with all that with all that in mind, uh, when you when you have a when you have a game that can that can go in that many in so many directions like that, a a question that a question that always 
comes up to me is analysis paralysis. And do you have plans in the core book to get to give some guidance? I guess ar- I guess archetypes would be the best word for me to use. Uh, so when it comes to character creation, we have the play ready avatars, which is a set of seven of one of each class uh, characters that um, have a predetermined set of aptitudes, talents, and even a deck that you can use if you want. Mm-hmm. Um, but beyond that, during play, um, because every character has particular talents um, that make them especially good at certain types of activities and situations, um, the paralysis, the, the the choice paralysis should be reduced uh, somewhat, because you, uh, it, out of all the options that you have, some will be, for you, objectively better. Mm-hmm. Uh, simply because you are geared towards a particular solution to a situation. Um, and aside from that, all of these uh, mechanics, the fate clock, the approach plan, even the talents to some degree are opt-in. So you can play the game without them if you want. Mm-hmm. Uh, to learn the system is, is the initial intent. But if if you like that and are content with that, you can just play the game without those things. Mm-hmm. They are not necessary to play the game. They just enrich your options and uh, hopefully the experience. Mm-hmm. And with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a page count for the full book? Um, so we're not aiming for a particular number, but we, uh, based on what we are, uh, what we've already written and uh, what we are still writing, um, we expect the core book to have between 200 and 300 pages of text, mm-hmm. including art uh, and index and everything. Which is a reasonable amount for a co- for a core book. And yeah. what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date per se, but a general um, ballpark. So if the uh, Kickstarter is a success, and we're very close, so uh, we, uh, we think we, we will make it, uh, then uh, we intend to make sure everybody who uh, th- that the initial copies will be available for everybody in September next year. Um, and as soon as everybody, all the uh, uh, backers have their copy, um, we will be looking into uh, alternate ways of um, sh- spreading uh, the game uh, mm-hmm. to other people who are interested. Yeah. And- Given the card design, have you guys um, put put some consideration into how you'd ha- have this work with, say, Tabletop Simulator or other virtual tabletops? Um, for Tabletop Simulator, um, I have looked into it. Uh, it is uh, Once we have all the cards, it should be relatively easy to do. So that's probably something we will be uh, bringing out, for, free for everyone to use. Um, we still have the application for any other types of table, a virtual tabletop where people can just have their own uh, application running on their PC. Um, and since the GM doesn't have to actually see your card for the most part, uh, that should be fine. Um, there is, with regards to cheating, that is a risk, you could say. Um, we have we have opinions about cheating uh, as, as, our, as designers. Um, that basically come down to don't do it. Why would you cheat, really? What, what are what are you getting out of it? So we're not really concerned about that as much. Um, so people running their own instance and just telling their GM what they have drawn as cards that uh, should be mostly functional uh, and a, a, a practical experience. Um, and as, as far as cards go for buying them physically. Um, in Europe, uh, we are still looking into good ways to distribute them. Uh, there is a distinct possibility that we're uh, that we're going for something like drive through RPG uh, for distributing them in uh, North America. Mm-hmm. Now, I will be looking forward to seeing how th- how that develops. But with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to, up to my temple and no problem I, f- I felt very welcome <laughs> <laughs> I u- I usually am pretty welcome because it because it's a long trek up the mountain <laughs> <laughs> but anytime you see fit to return the door is always open as I often say around here 
Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> uh, cheers to that. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!